Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for the first online educational event of the year for surface measurement systems. Today we'll be exploring the topic of battery electrode active materials characterization and we're incredibly lucky to be joined by Joanna Sikesh and Dr. Annette Condor to explore today's topic. Just before we get into the presentations proper, I just wanted to highlight that you there will be a question and answer section at the end of today's session and you can take part in this in one of two ways. You can either submit your questions in the questions panel, you will see in the control panel to your right, or you could raise your hand during the session, during the Q&A session, and I will unmute your microphone so that you can ask the question yourself over your mic. This may be especially useful for people who have maybe have an extended or two-part question if you want to actively discuss it a bit more with the speakers. So once again, please submit your questions as we proceed through the presentations in the questions panel or raise your hand at the end. To kick us off today, we'll be going to Johanna Siegers from the Helmholtz Centrum Dresden Rosendorf, uh, and also specifically the Helmholtz Institute Freiburg for Resource Technology. Johanna is currently in the process of finishing her PhD this year, so we're very fortunate to have her to here today to share her insights with us. And then after Johanna, we will go straight to Dr. Condor, our very own resident absorption scientist. Absorption, absorption science specialist with a specialization in inverse gas chromatography and dynamic vapor absorption, who will be able to take us through the rest of the presentation. So without further ado, I will hand over to Johanna. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I just need to share the proper screen. Okay. I hope everyone can see the screen now. Um, perfect. Okay, so thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, yes, um, as he already said, I'm from the Helmholtz Institute Freiburg for Resource Technology, um, and we belong to the HRDR, so the Helmholtz Centrum Dresden Rosendorf, um, which is situated in Dresden. So uh, we are situated in eastern Germany, but especially the Helmholtz Institute is situated in Freiburg which is a, a rather small town with a roughly 40,000 inhabitants, also in eastern uh, Germany, very close to the Ore Mountains, um, because for us, we work, we work um, along the whole value chain. So we have uh, different departments from exploration, analytics, um, processing, of course. So basically everything um, that is close to resources and uh, raw materials, so that's why we are situated in Freiberg, because here we also have uh, one of the oldest uh, mining universities um, in Germany. Um, yes, so the Freiberg is really the place to be when you work <laughs> with uh, in mineral processing, let's say that this way. Um, the work that I'm going to present to you today is not only from myself alone, but also from my colleagues, um, Anna Wanderbrüggen and Martin Rudolf. Okay, so first um, I want to show you the battery structure. So on the left, you can see uh, yeah, a common battery. Um, then one picture more to the right, we have pyrolyzed this battery to get rid of mostly all these um, hazardous electrolytes. Um, and then you can see a vertical cross section. So basically we cut it in half and you can see um, yeah, the cross section, which is embedded in an epoxy resin. And if we then zoom a bit more into uh, the battery, you can already see these straight lines, which are the electrodes. And if we then zoom a bit more, um, then you can see the electrodes. We have a, we have a cathode active material and, uh, and, and an anode. They are separated, um, also covered with an aluminum foil and a copper foil. And in case of the anode material, usually we use uh, graphite. But for the cathode material, there are different compositions possible. So, um, for example, we have NMC, which would be nickel manganese cobalt oxide, but also LCO, so lithium cobalt oxide, or um, a rather new material, uh, let's say this way, is LFP. So this would be lithium iron phosphate. phosphate. Um, but there are many uh, other composites possible. And yeah, if we then zoom in a bit more, then on the left, you can see a structure. So the blue particles would be the ele electrode active particles from our cathode. Um, um, 
and the the tiny black dots that you see this is the carbon black um, so this is really really fine carbon um, in a nanometer range uh, which is covered uh, or basically the electrodes are coated with this to increase the conductivity and then you also see the like an orange shade um, surrounding uh, the the particles which is the binder um, which basically is used to yeah to hold everything together um, for example, here there's uh, PVDF used, uh, but there are also other binders, uh, yeah, commercially uh, used in the industry. So basically, from all of this, you can already see the battery is a quite a complex composite structure, especially uh, the cathode materials, but also because we have we have uh, organic material, we have metals, so we have all of this together um inside the battery so also for the recycling um it's quite a challenge yeah so why do we want to recycle the batteries maybe i don't need to ask these questions anymore because um yeah over the last months and years it's it's became more prominent um also with uh, electric vehicles and everything um yeah that we really need to recycle the batteries in order to recover all of the valuable metals that are inside a battery so here on the left, you can see a diagram uh, which shows the supply risk uh, versus the economic importance, which is um, basically made or came up from the European Commission. Um, and you can see, especially the graphite uh, and the cobalt are critical raw materials, but also this report is uh, by now a few years old. So um, could the, even the other ones, they all of them become more critical because the demand is increasing. Um, yes, here we have a composition of a, um, of a battery in percent. So you can see we have uh, almost 20% of the anode. So in our case, the graphite, then the lithium metal oxides for the cathode. Here we have up to 27%. And then we also have uh, quite some amount of copper and aluminum inside the battery. So when you just uh, look at these different uh, materials, we have over 60% of the batteries are valuable um, and critical resources. So um, in order to really keep up the good work that's been established with, uh, uh, yeah, with the uh, electric vehicles and everything and the green transition, we really need to recycle these, um, yeah, the batteries. Okay, so how do we do this in our department in Freiberg? So we focus mostly on a separation technique called froth flotation. Of course, there are many other uh, separation techniques for mineral processing, um, but in our case, we focus on froth flotation, which separates the particles according to their difference in wettability. So there are particles which are rather hydrophilic and they really like to interact with water, and there are particles which are hydrophobic and they do not like to interact with water. So if you put all of these particles in uh, in a huge tank, as you can see here on the left, um, usually you have a rotor stator system. So you have a lot of turbulence and mixing going on, and then you add air. Then the, the air, the bubbles will be very finely uh, dispersed and they will collide with the particles. And the particles, which are rather hydrophobic, will attach to the air bubble, they will rise to the top, and then you can collect the froth and basically, then you have your, your concentrate, or in the case of the batteries, we would call it the overflow product, which would be the graphite. And we have the underflow product, which are the cathode active materials, um, because they would stay in the suspension. And this is how uh, we would separate the graphite from the metal oxides. Of course, in most cases, um, especially in mineral processing, the desired uh, material that you want to float is not the one which is hydrophobic. So this is why we have um, a huge playground of reagents. We use surface active collector molecules, um, which attach selectively on certain minerals and uh, make them hydrophobic. So, and because the whole process has a lot to do with surface properties and also in general, for any kind of separation of materials, you really need to understand the particles and the, the material that you're working with in, able, um, in order to be able to really successfully and um, effectively separate them. <coughs> uh, 
sorry. Um, yes. So here are the materials uh, we are working with. Uh, for the cathode electrode, we have the LCO, the NMC, and the LFP. And for the anode electrode, we have the natural spheroidized graphite and the synthetic graphite. And on the bottom right, you can see a particle size distribution. So you can already see that uh, for the D90, they are all below 30 microns, so they're all quite fine. <coughs> I'm so sorry, I'm a bit sick. Um, <coughs> yes, really sorry. Um, so the LFP is much, much finer than the LCO and the NMC, whereas for the graphite, they're mostly uh, in the same size range, but the, um, the shape is very different. And also for the NMC, you can see it's much rougher than the LCO. <coughs> I'm so sorry. <coughs> okay, so now I come to the um, characterization techniques that we are using. So, <coughs> I'm really sorry. <coughs> um, yes, so I want to start with the IGC. Um, here, of course, in cooperation with surface measurement systems, um, we, we use the uh, inverse gas chromatography to analyze the materials for their surface energy. And um, here you have the particles inside a, a glass column and you send through known probe molecules and according to the interaction of the molecules with the particles, um, you get information on different physical chemical parameters. <coughs> Sorry, properties. Um, we also use the Washburn method um, here you have a glass tube where you put your particles inside. You have a frit at the bottom, and when you put the frit in contact with water, the particles, if, if they're hydrophilic, they take up water, and the water uptake um, is measured, and from this you can get contact angles, and via the contact angles you can also get um, kind of a surface energy uh, values. We use the optical contour analysis method where you have, um, in our case, there are different methods or conditions how you can analyze this. But in our case, we had a, a tiny glass vial where we had uh, water inside. We put our particles, attach them to the, to the, to the ground. We could put a gas bubble on top and we measured um, the contact angle. <coughs> yeah, sorry. Um, so the last three me methods were more um, focused on only one parameter, so surface energy or contact angle. But um, we also did um, a few studies where we where you have a bit, um, yeah, where more particle properties come into play, let's say it this way, and which is a bit more realistic in terms of flotation. So here we have the particle bubble attachment where we have a syringe. Also, again, in this little glass, um, a vial filled with water. We have our suspension inside. We create a, um, a gas bubble uh, at the end of the syringe. We stir the particles. After some time, we stop the stirring. We let everything settle. And then we analyze the amount of particles that is attached to the gas bubble. And we also have some, some analytic particle solvent extraction tests. So we have uh, a separating funnel with two faces. In the bottom, you have the aqueous phase, and in the top, you have the organic phase, in our case, cyclohexane. Um, you disperse the particles inside, you let it rest and wait for the phases to separate. And afterwards, after the phase separation, you can uh, see how many particles transferred to which phase. Okay. First, <laughs> I need to drink something, sorry. Okay, first, I want to start with the... Um, contact angle measurements using using the Washburn method. So here on the left, you have an, an actual picture how, how it really looks uh, in our lab. So you have this little gas tube where the particles are inside. This is not the battery material, which is usually very black. So this is a different kind of material, but just to, to get you an idea how it looks. So the white thing, that's, uh, that's the particles. And then it is dipped into water. And depending yeah, on how much water is taken up, you, uh, from this, uh, after evaluation, you get the contact angle. So for the LCO, we got a contact angle of roughly 50 degrees. But for the NMC, we were not able to get a proper contact angle because um, we had some problem 
with the PET packaging, which is probably due to swelling. So for the after the evaluation, we saw that the data set, let's say it's not um, meaningful for the evaluation. So here, unfortunately, um, this didn't work and we didn't get a contact angle. And for the graphite, uh, we can only say that we have a contact angle above 90 degrees. Um, this is um, a slight drawback of the method because in, in theory, everything below 90 degrees hydrophilic, everything above 90 degrees is hydrophobic. And of course, of course that graphite, um, if there's no water uptake at all, you can only say it is hydrophobic and it's above 90 degrees, but you cannot, um, you do not have an exact contact angle. So it could be 90 degrees, it could also be 150, we don't know. Um, these, are results, these are the results with the optical contour analysis. So um, as I said, we have the particles on the bottom, we place a gas bubble on top, and for the LCO and the NMC, you can really see um, the gas bubble does not really want to interact with the particles. Um, it really stays at the um, syringe. We get contact angles of 14 or 15 degrees, so um, really, really hydrophilic. But for the graphite, you can see already that the bubble is attached to the graphite, and we get a contact angle of around 140 degrees. So here, you could really say, according to these contact angles and the definition of the contact angles, that the graphite is hydrophobic and the metal oxides are hydrophilic. So if we just look at these contact angles, the separation should be very easily done because we have really high difference in wettabilities. But of course, <laughs> um, in a lot of cases, this is uh, in theory not uh, the case. Because if we want to now <clears throat> look into the a real battery, because these were all the pure materials. So if we now get into the real battery as a composite material, here there's a, a picture where you can see the NMC particles uh, all agglomerated and they're surrounded by the binder. So the yellowish, um, uh, yeah, so the yellowish uh, color and shade, that's the binder, which is surrounding all these NMC particles. And if we now do the contact angle measurements again, here you can already see we have a contact angle for LCO, which is coated with a binder of 75 degrees, and the graphite coated with a binder is 81 degrees. Uh, so here you can already see that this really nice difference that we had before for the pure materials is basically gone. And um, yeah, this is all due to the binder. So the binder makes the more hydrophilic particles more hydrophobic, and the more hydrophobic particles more hydrophilic. And this really is a problem. So uh, one really crucial step for the flotation is the pre-processing to remove the binder. Otherwise, um, yeah, this will, this will not work. But of course, there are also other challenges. So if we now come back to the pure materials, um, so just the pure NMC, just the pure LCO, pure graphite, here, um, as I said, we did this uh, extraction test where we had the two phases. So according uh, to their wettability, if they are rather hydrophilic, they would transfer to the aqueous phase. If they are rather hydrophobic, they would transfer to the organic phase, in our case, cyclohexane, and the aqueous phase is just tap water. Then according to the uh, contact angle measurements we just saw for the pure materials, we would expect the graphite to go into the organic phase and the metal oxides to go into the hydrophilic phase because, I mean, contact angles of 14 degrees those are really, really small. So um, they really show hydrophilic, um, they should show hydrophilic behavior, let's say it this way. But if we have a look at the results that we get, we can see that almost all of the material, regardless of which material we are using, goes to the organic phase. So uh, this is rather yeah, a contradiction, let's say, to the um, results of the contact angles. But for this method, what I was saying earlier on when I introduced to you the uh, different techniques, here also other particle properties um, come into play. So the behavior of the particles at the, at the interface is not only determined by the contact angle, but also by the particle shape, by the particle size, porosity, roughness, and there are a lot of other factors that we have to include here in order to explain this behavior. 
So for example, if you have a look um, at this uh, small image, for example, here we've just uh, put some NMC powder into water, nothing else. Uh, and I hope you can all see it, it's very tiny, but um, there, there are gas bubbles on top of this, on, on the material, on the NMC powder. So here we also see that despite it is rather hydrophilic in terms of contact angles, um, we assume due to the very rough surface, what you have seen of the SEM pictures, um, we do not have a complete wetting of the particles. So this is also another factor. So here you really would have to um, make sure that the particles are wetted completely in order to really have this hydrophilic behavior. Okay, so now I want to come to the IGC uh, results. So as I said before, the um, IGC, it's a gas probing technique. So we have this column and uh, inside the column, we have our particles that we want to analyze. And then we send different probe molecules through the column. And depending on the interactions of the probe molecules with the sample, we can then obtain information about the surface energy. Um, of course, there are different other, like, there's a range of other parameters um, that you can also extract like Hansen solubility parameters, work of adhesion. But in our case, we are focused on the surface energy because um, as you can see on the image on the right, uh, there's, um, it's not a direct correlation, but uh, the trend is in a way that with increasing surface energy, the surface becomes more wettable. So if you now uh, think in terms of contact angles, um, if you have a low surface energy, you have very high contact angles um, and the surface is not easily wetted by water. And if the surface energy is increasing, the wettability is increasing. Um, yes, for the surface energy, uh, we have a total surface energy of the particles, but the total surface energy is made up of a dispersive component and a polar component. And in order to um, analyze or obtain those two different components, we use different probe molecules. So for the dispersive part, we usually use um, alkanes. Um, yeah, so the common ones would be, for example, hexane, heptane, octanone, and decane. Um, uh, for the polar parts, there are also different molecules used. In our case, we use ethyl acetate and dichloromethane to um, obtain the loose acid and loose base uh, component, which make up the polar component of the surface energy. Yes. And we can also obtain information about the heterogeneity of the sample in terms of surface energy by changing the quantity of the probe molecules that we send through the column. So we can only send very tiny amounts and we can send um, a huge amount of uh, molecules over the surface that can interact then with the particles. And this gives us information about the heterogeneity of the surface. Okay, so first I want to start with the surface energy results for the cathode materials. So here um, on the top, you just see again, the some information on the measurement. So we used the finite dilution uh, condition. So we changed the quantity of the, of the probe molecules, the amount. We, so yeah, in order to get the distributions, uh, we measured this at 100 degrees and the calculation were done with the Doris and Gray method and the Della Volpe scale. Um, yes, the probe molecules I already introduced to you. And uh, yes, here you can see in the graph the results. So we have these distribution curves for the surface energy, for LCO in blue, NMC in green, and LFP in red. And um, on the left, uh, rather for the lower values, those are the polar parts. And then on the right side, um, middle right side, you can see the dispersive part and the, po uh, sorry, and the total part of the surface energies. Um, yes. So what you can see here is that LFP in red has the lowest total surface energy and it is the most homogeneous because it has the, the narrowest distribution. Whereas for NMC, it has a really wide distribution of surface energies and also the highest uh, total surface energy with roughly 150 millijoule per square meter. Um, also very interesting is that the dispersive part, so if you check the, the maximum value of the LCO, NMC, and LFP um, for the dispersive part, for all of them, it is usually, or it is around 120 millijoule per square meter. So the dispersive part is rather similar, whereas the polar part, here we have a, a significant difference. So for the LFP, 
um, we can say that the polar parts is almost, yeah, it is neglectable. Whereas for the NMC, it has a quite high polar part with almost up to 30 millijoules per square meter. So there's a significant difference in the polar surface energy components between the cathode active materials. If we now have a look at the anode materials, so we have the natural graphite and the synthetic graphite, uh, you can already see also on first sight, there's a huge difference between those uh, two materials. So the natural graphite in uh, grayish uh, colors, we here we have a very, very homogeneous surface, so there's almost no distribution at all, whereas for the synthetic, synthetic graphite, we have a huge or large distribution and also the surface, the maximum surface energy value is really different with 120 for the natural graphite and then roughly 170 for the synthetic graphite. Um, and also for the polar parts, um, yeah, there's some, some deviation there. Uh, of course, the, if we have a look at the, at the graphite, um, the most uh, reasonable explanation for the difference is the different processing route. So the synthetic graphite is usually obtained from raw materials like petroleum coke or coal tar pitch, and it goes through a lot of different processes. So also very high temperatures for the graphitization to finally end up with a synthetic graphite. Whereas the natural uh, spheroidized graphite is usually uh, recovered from a, from a real graphite ore. Uh, which is then um, yeah, recovered after mining and the flotation process and uh, goes uh, basically through the spheroidization to get these uh, what we call potato shaped um, graphite particles. Yeah, so this is, this is a very different uh, treatment uh, for the material. So um, yeah, and which, which we can actually see here in the surface energies. If we now have a look at both of them, so on the left we have the cathode materials, on the right we have the anode materials again. Um, we cannot really say uh, there's a general trend because as we can see the graphite is, is so different. Um, we cannot say that the anode behaves like this and the, the cathode behaves like this. Um, it's, it's more of a complex story, let's say it this way. Uh, what we can, yeah, maybe like for the polar surface energy components there are yeah, a bit higher for the cathode materials, but also here we have the LFP um, with almost no polar components. So yeah, it's really hard to to uh, deduce anything from just from the surface energy. So you really need to see the whole picture at the end. Okay, so this is um, again the surface energy obtained for SCO, NMC, and the natural serverized graphite, just for those three components. Um, now as a bar chart and uh, yeah, a bit different visualization. So we have the dispersive part in blue and the polar part uh, in orange. Um, this is for comparison reasons because with the Washburn method, I, I told you we can also extract the surface energy from there um, with the OWRK method. So um, here we have the values for the surface energy from the Washburn analysis. And um, I find it very interesting um, that the values are so different. Here we could say, uh, yes, this could be possible because the measurement temperatures are very different. So for the IGC, um, these measurements were done at 100 degrees, whereas the Washburn method is done at 20 degrees. So we have a huge temperature difference, which um, really influences also the service energy. Uh, but this, uh, Annette will show you a bit uh, more in more detail later on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I want, oh, I'm so sorry. But what I found even more interesting is, um, sorry, that, um, I'm really sorry, um, that not only the final values, but also the different components are completely different. <coughs> okay. Sorry. Um, so for the IGC, we get the natural spheroidized graphite <clears throat> with the lowest uh, polar component and the NMC with the highest polar component. But for the Washburn analysis, we get the NMC with the lowest polar component and the LCO with the highest polar component. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, yes, 
So even though we have these different temperatures where we could explain the, the final total <clears throat> surface energy values, but um, I would have at least expected that, um, that the tendencies within the materials regarding the dispersive and the polar part <clears throat> follow the same trend, which we have not. Um, so basically here also another message <clears throat> from my side, you always have to be very careful when comparing um, values that you got from different um, techniques. So on the one hand, we have the IGC, which is a, yeah, we have a dry powder, but it's a gas probing technique. So you really have this molecular interactions <coughs> of the probe molecules with the particles. Um, whereas for the wash burn analysis, uh, we also have a powder bed, but um, you use water as a, as a bulk. So you have a liquid covering a large surface. <coughs> I'm really sorry. Um, yes, on the other hand, for the IGC, because in both cases, we do not get the surface energy directly. So we also, we always get it indirectly by, by calculation afterwards. What we actually measure from the IGC is uh, the retention times of the probe gases. And for the wash pan analysis, it's the penetration times or the water uptake. So, um, and after the calculations there, we then finally get the surface energy. But the actual data that we measure is very different. Yes, and also what I said, the temperature is also very different. So it's, um, yeah, we really have to be cautious and careful when comparing uh, results that we get from different characterization techniques. Okay, now I want to come to the particle bubble attachment. So again, we have this little setup. Um, so the left picture, you can see this is how it looks in our lab. So we have this tiny glass vial filled with um, our suspension. We have the syringe from the top where we create the gas bubble. We have the particles. Um, we stir the suspension and uh, after um, yeah, stopping, ending the stir arm, we let everything settle and then we can analyze um, the surface or the bubble loading, how much, how much percentage of the surface of the bubble was covered with particles. So, and here you can see uh, the bubble loading in percent for the NMC on the left and for the right it's the graphite. And as you can see, although we have this huge difference in contact angles, um, again, we have just like for the extraction test, we have a very similar behavior now when it comes to the actual behavior at the interface and in the process. So for both of them, we get roughly 25% um, of particles that are attached to the bubble. But here, as I said, the good thing um, in our case is that we have a lot of uh, reagents to play with. So as soon as we add a selective reagent, in our case, Escade, you can see Although the NMC bubble loading is also increased by a, by a bit, so now we are at a bit over 30% for the NMC, but for the graphite, we really, um, yeah, we increased to 100% bubble coverage. So here, the SK8 um, interacts with the graphite particles and really enhances the hydrophobicity. But of course, we have to be really cautious because even though a lot of people are stating that the metal oxides are hydrophilic, they still form stable attachments to an air bubble, even without adding any kind of reagents. Okay, so we also did some real flotation tests. Here we can see the recovery in percent. So we have the graphite and the NMC, again, without reagent in blue and with some reagent um, in orange. And here again, you can see that, um, yeah, when using the escade, we have a recovery of graphite above 80%. Uh, which is really well, which is really nice um, for the NMC. Yeah, we do have some uh, recovery, which is probably due to, um, there can be many reasons. So one reason, of course, it could be due to what we call true flotation. So the particle actually, actually sticks to the bubble and rises to the top, we can collect it as a froth. Or we have mechanisms, which we, what we call entrainment. So um, in the graph, you can see entrainment in the froth when the bubble, uh, sorry, when the particle is not attached directly to the bubble, but it's rather in the lamella, so in the where the liquid is inside the froth. Um, or, for example, it could be entrapped inside the graphite agglomerate because I don't know if you saw it, but on the previous slide, 
the graphite was uh, quite um, yeah, agglomerating. So as we have a lot of fine particles, the NMC could also be um, entrapped inside these agglomerates. So what is very important is to properly disperse the conditioned black mass, also to really wet the NMC. What I showed you earlier on, we have these tiny gas bubbles on the NMC particles. So it's really, uh, the pretreatment is really important in this case. Okay, so now I come to my summary and the outlook. Um, on the right, you can actually see a, um, a proper flotation or a lab flotation cell in our case. So you have this, uh, you have this frost on the top, which is scraped off. You collect it um, as the concentrate, or this would be the overflow product. And you have here some SEM images. So the top one is the feed, where you have the mixture of the uh, cathode active materials and the graphite, and then the overflow project, uh, product. You have mainly graphite and the underflow pro product. You have a lot of um, yeah, NMC and LCO. So basically, uh, one of the main points that I'm working on is that you really have to understand the particle properties in order for a successful separation, even though in the case for the battery materials, we haven't understood everything uh, yet. But we, I mean, research is always ongoing, so there are a lot of uh, things we, we have to uncover. Um, also, the good thing is that the process actually works. So, um, yeah, now we, but we still, we want to understand how everything is working. Also very important, um, usually in mineral processing, especially for flotation, a lot of people rely on the contact angle. That's why a lot of people stated that the, the metal oxides, they are hydrophilic. Um, and of course, if you just look at the contact angle, they are hydrophilic and the graphite is hydrophobic. But just one single value is not sufficient. So you cannot only take the contact angle, you can also not only take the surface energy, you know. What I mean is you always have to have a look at the broader picture and then, um, yeah, then you really can describe the particles. Uh, of course, the lithium metal oxides, they are less hydrophobic than graphite. But of course, uh, as I just said, they cannot really be considered hydrophilic um, in total, because of course, even them, even them being hydrophilic, uh, as people say, they still attach to the gas bubble, gas bubble, and they are still recovered. So, um, and this is just for the pure material. So I showed you at the beginning, if we set the binder on top, this is even worse. So the binder removal is very crucial if you want to successfully separate the particles. Then, um, yeah, so flotation, I only showed you one reagent, but usually in the flotation, you have a frother, you have a collector, which renders the, the particles hydrophobic. You also have depressants, which render other particles hydrophilic. So you have a lot of chemicals and reagents in there and a lot of um, yeah, interactions, which are really complex. You also have the hydrodynamics, you have a suspension phase, you have a, so, you have a froth phase. So it's really a complex proce process. Um, and there's a lot of research going on in that field. And of course, one topic, especially for the batteries, it's, it's really like for the anode, it's usually the graphite doesn't change too much, although also here we have these different types of graph different types of graphite. But for especially for the cathode side, here we have a really complex um, composition with all these different uh, yeah materials possible NMC, LCO, now LFP, um, and there's so much research going on, and it's really really complex and a really tough task then later for the recycling because you cannot treat um, all the, the different things um, are the same. So basically in the worst case, you have to, for all the different things, you have to find a, a, um, an individual processing route. Um, yes, so, so there's a lot to do from our side. Um, I hope uh, I could show you a few interesting things. Uh, of course, if you have questions, always uh, contact me, contact Annette. Um, I'm very happy to answer all your questions. Here are also some of our latest publications in the field of battery research, but also on the field of um, particle characterization, also ultrafine particles, um, many different um, yeah, publications. Uh, go have a look at them. If uh, you could also text me, um, send me an email, and I could uh, forward them to you. If yeah, so just feel free to ask. And uh, with this, I'd like to finish my presentation and thank you very much for your attention. So I will just continue with the 
with the characterization of these materials, what Johanna uh, introduced, and I will not um, in, uh, show them again. Um, so first I will show you some uh, DVS results and then uh, some surface energy um, data and why the surface energy is important. And at the end, I will show you an interesting case study on the uh, interfacial interactions in uh, solid state batteries. Uh, the DVS instrument that we used uh, to measure um, uh, the water sorption and the cyclohexane sorption of these different uh, battery materials. Um, the aim was to understand deeper uh, the separation process, the wettability results, what um, Johanna uh, got, and um, also in order, in order to improve um, these processes or the separation process. And um, the DVS um, uh, system is basically a gravimetric uh, technique. So there's a balance. On one side, uh, we place uh, the sample, and then we introduce a different percentage of um, uh, humidity or um, uh, cyclohexane concentration. And at each step, um, we weight um, uh, how much uh, the sample uh, uh, absorb. absorb and um, once we reached um, the concentration, the 90%, we decreased this concentration and we measured the desorption. So at the end, we can get desorption, sorption curve uh, from data. And um, we measure the, the water sorption uh, of this uh, lithium metal oxide and uh, the graphite sample. So first, you, uh, here's um, the water sorption curve at 25 Celsius of uh, lithium cobalt oxide. You can see the water uptake is uh, quite low. Uh, it's um, and seems uh, after the sorption, uh, the sample message goes back to the the initial. Um, so it's a reversible process. This water sorption. Um, in case of the MS, MNMC. Uh, what we saw, uh, it has much higher water uptake compared with the uh, lithium cobalt oxide. So 10 times higher water uh, it can absorb because of um, higher affinity to uh, absorb attract water. And the, the sorption uh, is not reversible. So it's irreversible. So there's some water which remain on the surface. And in case of LFP and uh, pyrolyzed uh, graphite, we already um, could measure the, the cyclohexane uh, sorption desorption curve. And you can see that LFP and pyrolyzed graphite, so LFP is on the uh, left side, on the right side, the pyrolyzed graphite. So you can see that both samples uh, seems has um, a higher uptake um, with the uh, cyclohexane and the water uh, is quite small, especially in case of the, the pyrolyzed graphite. And uh, seems they has a, a better affinity with cyclohexane, with organic. And that's basically supports uh, the separation data what um, uh, Johanna got. And um, we also have the data already also for LCO, the lithium cobalt oxide. And since lithium cobalt oxide has a very low uh, cyclohexane um, ache mass in percentage, it's a mass um, percentage. So seems um, they are really, um, the seems more um, hydrophobic uh, materials. Uh, which uh, also, yeah, supports the uh, the wettability uh, test, uh, the extraction process what uh, Johanna did, uh, but it does not support the the contact angle uh, data. Uh, these results are still um, in, in in progress. So currently, we are measuring the NF NMC cyclohexane uh, sorption and desorption. Uh, curve and also after that we'll continue with the other samples um, to get uh, really uh, the whole picture about all the different uh, 
lithium metal oxides and the different uh, uh, graphite samples. But uh, so far, um, the DVS data um, uh, shows similarity uh, with uh, the wettability test uh, or the extraction. Um, just uh, to summarize again uh, the, the different components of battery materials, there's cathode, anode, separator, and electrolyte. And uh, the battery um, performance um, depends on the energy density, power density, um, thermal stability also, which is quite important. And also, everyone knows that um, in case of winter, the electric cars uh, range is much shorter than during summer. So uh, the temperature has really an effect on the performance of batteries. Also, um, the temperature can affect uh, properties at molecular uh, level of the battery materials. So there can be a structure, physical chemical, electrochemical changes um, due to the temperature. Some examples for structural changes. So um, there can be volume change or gas um, transition, um, phase transition. Uh, some physical chemical properties can also change due to the temperature. So surface chemistry, to surface energy can change. Electron density can be changed. So all these uh, properties at molecular level, which are changing uh, due to the temperature, probably affects the performance of battery materials at uh, different uh, weather conditions or different environments. And we think that maybe um, there can be a direct correlation uh, between surface energy and uh, the temperature effect on the performance of batteries. Because what is surface energy really, really? It's basically the willingness of the surface to react with the surroundings because um, atoms in the center of the material, they interact um, uh, with each other, but on the surface, they only interact towards to the center and some surface electrons can react with the surroundings. And probably this affects these, uh, the electron uh, uh, reactivity, the electrons reactivity affects the, the performance. Um, surface energy um, is a symbol is the same as the surface tension, gamma and as Johanna mentioned also, yeah, it has different components, uh, dispersive and specific. Um, and the specific can be also divided for two um, components, the, the acid and the base, so the, the Lewis acid and base component. Solid state batteries uh, become quite uh, popular and um, um, because it's, it's safer, um, and uh, there's no electrolyte, um, and uh, there's no liquid electrolyte, uh, which uh, is uh, very flammable. So battery materials, um, the market is going towards to this direction. But there's a lot of challenges in case of uh, solid state batteries, uh, for example, uh, to, to achieve homo homogeneous distribution of the and compounds, the solid electrolyte, the active material, and the carbon. And um, to achieve this um, uh, uniform or homogeneous distribution, the, the inter um, facial interaction, so the surface energy, uh, plays an important role. And also, um, it helps also to see the compatibility between the different um, and also it helps to, to improve this material um, future. So the results um, on the thermal stability at the moment, uh, we just uh, focused on the, the effect of the temperature on surface energy of different of these different uh, materials. So first we investigated the, the, the graphite samples. So we had the natural graphite and the synthetic graphite. 
Um, the natural graphite um, was from Sigma, which is specially made for um, anode powder. It's actually made for uh, battery application. And the mesophase graphite, it's uh, from Institute. On this slide, you can see the dispersive surface energy of the natural graphite. And I, I will show you the surface energy profiles instead of the distribution graph, which was generated exactly from this profile. What you want to show to you, that it's, it's exact, uh, the same uh, data set used. It's just a different uh, demonstration. So in case of natural graphite, the surface uh, energy is quite uniform, so not much distribution of surface energy at different temperatures. And also you can see it doesn't change much with the temperature. The specific surface energy is very low, as we expected. It's, it's graphite. So that uh, small specific uh, part, what we measure probably it comes from impurities or just uh, error of the measurement. Uh, synthetic graphite uh, surface energy um, clearly changed with the temperature. Um, at the moment, we also measure uh, the 120 Celsius of this sample. Um, and this synthetic graphite um, uh, is made from uh, coal tar uh, pitch. And, um, it has also a heterogeneous uh, surface energy profile. So it's not that uniform as natural graphite. And if we compare the two uh, graphite samples, the synthetic and natural graphite at the same temperature, you can see, clearly see the difference that natural graphite is more homogeneous energetically, while synthetic graphite is very heterogeneous energetically. Why, why is it important? Because if there's um, energy heterogeneity, so that if the surface is not uniform energetically, it can affect uh, different uh, processes and applications. So the flowability, processability of these uh, materials, dissolution, dispersion is affected by this. So, and of course, the coating quality, uh, because in that case, um, surface. So it's very important that the heterogeneity of the samples, it has an effect on, on so many other things. On the next couple of slides, I will show you um, how the temperature affects the surface energy in case of uh, the, li uh, the lithium metal oxide. So we measure lithium cobalt oxide, NMC, uh, the nickel magnesium cobalt oxide, and LFP, the, the pure lithium iron phosphate. Lithium cobalt oxide uh, surface energy clearly changing and increasing uh, with the temperature. So um, the temperature um, has a huge effect on the surface energy of this uh, material. NMC also changing with the temperature, increasing trend again. And um, so the surface properties of both cathodes are changing with the temperature. Um, we have also, uh, we measured uh, recently just uh, the lithium iron phosphate surface energy at 100 degrees C and we compared with the, the LCO. And um, you can see that um, there's significant difference between a LCO and LFP, as also Johanna mentioned. LFP has a very, very small specific surface energy, even smaller than LCO, and also it has a higher uh, dispersive surface energy. So which means that um, the LFP uh, surface polarity vetability is very low and compared with the LCO. This is what we also saw in in case of the DVS results, that um, LFP um, has, uh, shows better sorption uh, behavior with the cyclohexane compared with the, the LCO, uh, which seems has a um, higher uh, water uptake than cyclohexane. So this supports the data, uh, what we got with the DVS. And just to compare all the different cathode materials, cathode uh, materials, at one temperature it's 100 Celsius. Um, 
And this is just a dispersive surface energy. I focus just the dispersive energy, as I will show you on this slide, uh, the quantum materials as well. You can see that, yeah, at the infinite dilution, since uh, they are very similar, as also Johanna mentioned, and clearly we could see from the distribution graph. There's a slightly difference in uh, heterogeneity of these samples. And um, LFP has quite significantly higher, at, uh, with higher uh, concentration, affinity concentration, compared with the LC or the NMC. On old materials, the, both the natural graphite and the meso uh, phase graphite has significantly higher uh, dispersive surface energies than these um, materials. So you can see that um, they are um, not completely the same as also you have highlighted there. There's not really similarity in the surface energy um, within them. The Interfacial uh, interactions in solid state batteries. This is a really uh, important and um, high demand topic in research right now. And uh, this graph is really um, explain all the different uh, interactions between interfaces and the different uh, components in uh, solid state batteries. Also, there's a more uh, nicer explanation uh, of all these different interactions. So, there's uh, on the on the left side you can see an uncoated cathode, and on the other side you can see a coated cathode. When it's an uncoated cathode, there can be uh, interactions between the solid electrolyte and cathode, cathode and carbon, and also the common uh, types of interaction on the middle you can see. But in case of coated cathodes, there are even more uh, different uh, interactions. So the the coating material and um, uh, the the solid um, electrolyte, and also the the cathode and the coating on its surface. Um, and if the coating is not complete, uh, there can be um, or imperfect, um, there can be a solid electrolyte and cathode interaction still. Um, so it's it's very very complex, as also you have highlighted, and to really understand um, the effects and uh, what's happening uh, in the batteries, and also how these batteries can be improved and then also recycled, uh, we have to measure uh, and we have to characterize them, understand a bit more deeply um, the effects and uh, what's the temperature. Um, can cause on, on these samples. Just to summarize, but uh, IGC uh, can provide you if you are working on this field, um, research and development of battery materials. So it can uh, determine or it can provide you um, comprehensive surface characterization of these materials. You can also measure the temperature effect on these properties and also the, the humidity effect on these properties. You can uh, get processing performance of these batteries. As uh, you could see in case of the two different graphite, the natural and the synthetic graphite, um, the, the production route, the processing route is different and it's clearly uh, cause differences in surface energy and surface chemistry. And it's very, very important uh, to um, to see how big is this defense. You can also uh, get with uh, IGC system. Also, you can uh, determine from the surface energy adhesion, cohesion, dispersion properties. Uh, you can predict how uh, compatible the, the dispersion uh, per, uh, special behavior and uh, finally also binder cutout compatibility what we can uh, what you can also uh, determine from this uh, with this uh, IGC system what we have so before um, 
I, um, before we answer the questions, I would like to thank uh, to my uh, colleagues, um, to Helmholtz Institute uh, to collaborate with us because it was uh, a really uh, interesting um, study so far <laughs> and it's, it's still going on. It's really um, uh, fascinating how uh, the different techniques and how the different uh, characterization uh, show different properties of these materials and how useful are they. And also thanks to my uh, to Armando and uh, Connor who, who's been running the DVS um, measurements and Daniel Burnett also to to his support and uh, all the um, meaningful uh, insights of this uh, study. Thank you also for your attention and time, and um, we are happy to answer your uh, questions. Thank you very much, Annette. That was great. And another thank you to Johanna Sigesh. Uh, so yes, just a reminder to our audience, you can now submit your questions in the questions panel in writing, or you can raise your hand and we can unmute your microphone so you can ask the question yourself. Uh, so just course. to kick us off, yeah, sorry, no, just to, no, 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 I mean, sometimes sometimes people don't like to ask questions openly, so of course you can also, I think I, I showed my e my email address and I, it should also be somewhere on the advertisement, so in case there are any questions afterwards, just feel free to contact me, um, I guess the same as, as for Annette, <laughs> uh, I will speak for us both, so in case you have any questions afterwards, feel free to contact us and we are happy to, to talk to you about, yeah, all of this. Because yeah. sometimes I, I often have mm -hmm. questions coming in afterwards. People were like, yeah, I didn't have time or I didn't want to ask in front of the others or yeah, so there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I'm the same in that way. <laughs> um, well, we have our, our first question here and they have asked um, just more of a general thing about the instrumentation used. Um, what is the maximum temperature used for the ITC column oven? Uh, the maximum, <laughs> yeah, the maximum what we used is 120, but the highest temperature is 500 Celsius, what we could use. Uh, but we, we didn't use in case of these materials, the highest. So we went up uh, with the measurements so for 120. We try to target now the lower temperatures um, to see um, the surface energy level at that uh, temperature. So um, maybe it, it can be directly correlated with um, the performance of the batteries at different temperatures. So yeah, that uh, temperature range. <laughs> um, someone's also asked um, what kind of range you can get on the typical sample mass used in these experiments. Um, yeah, good question. Um, I think we used from uh, 50 milligram to up to um, 150 milligram uh, of these different samples. Of course, depending on the surface area of these materials, because we wanted to keep the measurements uh, within a reasonable time frame. So if you use a lot of sample in the column to elute a P, uh, solvent, it takes quite long and um, we don't want to wait uh, weeks so and also it's not good if it's too too quick so about 150 was the maximum sample amount milligram yeah I don't know Johanna um, yeah I mean it really depends on the material what you are analyzing and on the BT of the material so yeah because according to the BT you also um, um, uh, adjust the, the quantity of the probe molecules that you sent over the surface. Um, yeah. So as you can see on the diagrams from Annette, it, it just said something like 0.2, so that would be 20% of the monolayer coverage based on the BET of the particles, based on the area of the molecule that you sent over the particles. So it always depends a bit um, what you, yeah, which, which particles you are analyzing. Exactly, and yeah. We, because also we definitely don't want to oversaturate the surface, so we focus on the interactions which occurs on the surface and uh, with the solid, and there's no solute-solute interactions. 
Yeah, so usually also, like, unless usually we measure only up to like 20%, roughly. Yeah, because afterwards, as you can already see, the diagram just, it's just flat. So afterwards, nothing really happens. So we usually, yeah. yeah, so we usually stop at 20% surface coverage. Yeah, but we also, I mean, there are different columns that you can use, like column with diameters. So depending on your material, also if it's finer or not. Um, yeah, so it depends, it's a bit, um, yeah material specific, let's say. But the nice thing about IGC is that you don't need a lot of material, so, yeah. yeah. Right, thank you. A uh, question here. Um, they wonder if you've considered, and uh, forgive my uh, lack of scientific parlance, but they've said, uh, they wonder if you've considered the LI loss during the flotation process. How can this issue be overcome? Yes, so that, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a good point. That's actually um, something that we've uh, yeah, also analyzed. So we've, we saw a lot of the lithium um, is actually in the solution afterwards. And we have another PhD student, Eliza, who's, um, yeah, which uh, her PhD is um, on exactly this topic. So she's analyzing the process water of flotation and um, she's using methods like ion exchange or something. So it's more into the metallurgical a uh, hydrometallurgical route um, to extract the lithium from the process water after flotation. Yeah. Thank Good you. Um, someone asks here, can we use any of these techniques to analyze the physical properties of thin film electrode sheets? Yes. I mean, DVS or IGC can be used also for thin films. <laughs> size of the film um, the IGC has a, a little bit limitation but for DVS uh, we can measure yeah definitely um, um, the next question here uh, we have an, a written question and then someone would like to unmute to ask a question as well um, Reese Jones asks what sort of technologies are used to coat cathode materials are these wet or dry technologies uh, I must admit, I don't know. <laughs> so um, we are more focused on the recycling, not on the battery production. So um, yeah, but yeah. Uh, he wanted to know because you measure the um, contact angle in case of SEO and graphite. I mean, in our, in our case, we for the contact angle in specific, we use the for the pure materials, we just yeah use the powder, the pure powder, and for the coated material. We, we used the wafer, which was coated with the binder. So we, we bought it this way. We didn't coat it ourselves. No. Okay. Um, and now uh, we have Monica Chowdhury, who would like to, uh, like to unmute her microphone and ask a question herself. So Monica, you can go ahead now. Hi. Hello. Hi, Monica. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hello. Ma'am, is it possible to utilize the waste material of lithium battery along with activated carbon for use uh, for generation of current in future? Sorry, you mean if we, so the recycled material, if we could use the, is again? In the yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, recycling. Yes. So, um, Yes, so the, so the results I showed you here, uh, it's just the pure materials really, but um, when when it comes to the, the real batteries, so we have a lot of corporations also with industry, um, and there we, we have a really high recovery and also grade of graphite. Um, so this, this, and we have another Helmholtz Institute uh, in Ulm, and they work um, with the graphite and it's, it's not directly my project, so I don't have all the details, but I know that we sent some of our recovered graphite to them and they analyzed the graphite and um, according to the capacity and uh, different things. So it's, the battery itself, it's not so much my, my thing, <laughs> more into the mineral processing and the recycling, um, but they analyzed it and uh, it is almost as good as, uh, let's say the first used uh, graphite. So we can really, um, in the future, let's say, because right now, in of course, future, lab, yes, yeah, of course, right now it's all lab scale, but first tests are really promising, so that you can really have good recycling. And another one, I think I didn't mention um, another plus 
uh, if we extract the graphite from the mixture of the, the metal oxides, from the black mass, basically, because nowadays uh, the graphite is, or, I mean, nowadays it's very critical, so people are really taking care of the graphite, trying to recycle it. But earlier, uh, in, yeah, a few years ago, they, there was still enough graphite coming from China, um, and graphite was not really, they didn't focus on the graphite. So what was done was after yes, the fire, no. or when it went to pyrometallurgical, pyrometallurgical processes, they used the graphite more as a reducing agent for recovering the metal oxides. But because China closed down their their graphite um, export, or basically they, they, uh, they limited it a bit. So then Europe uh, came to think that, okay, we really need to have a look at this. Um, and then, so we, at first, the first class of this process is that we recover the graphite and the second class is that afterwards, so the underflow project, which contains the metal oxides, usually follows then and goes to the pyrometallurgy, um, yeah, hydro hydrometallurgical processes like leaching and so on. And those processes are much more efficient when the graphite is um, not, yeah, not, uh, not there anymore. Because in those processing processes, graphite is more of a uh, yeah, inhibitor, let's say. So this is also a second plus if we extract the graphite beforehand. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, it's a very nice session. I gain so much uh, information from this uh, webinar. And thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, we are glad that it helped to gain some information. That was the focus, <laughs> that was the aim of this. <laughs> okay, uh, I think that is the last of our questions and hands raised. So um, I think we are over running a bit. So apologies to anyone who um, maybe had to push another meeting. <laughs> but um, So I think we will close up there for the day. So thank you once again so much to Johanna and Annette for being here today to share their insights with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here <laughs> to, to give me the chance to present. Um, and of course, yeah, everyone can always contact me whenever there are questions. So Yeah, or us. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we are still in contact with them, <laughs> each other. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for everyone's time. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, I'll John, also. <laughs> okay. I'll finish by saying yes. Um, if you do have any queries, please do get in contact with us at marketing at surface measurement systems.com or you can email us at science at surface measurement systems.com and we can put you in touch with either of today's speakers to discuss this further. Please do remember to check our website at www.surface measurement systems.com for other upcoming educational content. And uh, just to let you know, this session will be loaded to our YouTube account in the next few days. So if you maybe didn't catch the start or wanted to revisit any of the points raised, that will be loaded there. So just um, you can access that through our website. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you all once again for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Two. Yes.